head of the Institute of Microbiology and Microbial Biotechnology at the University of Natural Resources and the Life Science at Vienna. He is also co-founder of the Austrian Center of Industrial Biotechnology, where he directs the research area of microbial parts and systems. As if that was not enough, he's also vice president of the European Federation of Biotechnology and chairman of the International Yeast Commission. He's a world-class expert in metabolic engineering, especially in uh, the uh, model yeast, Comata, 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 uh, well, Pique Pastoris. I don't know this name, <laughs> this new name. <laughs> Uh, today, he's going to talk about how to uh, engineer a Calvin cycle to use CO2 as a car uh, carbon source in yeast. Thank you for accepting this invitation. Piedhar, you can start. Thank you very much for the kind uh, introduction and for inviting me. As I said uh, just before, I really regret not being with you, but uh, I hope there will be an a chance in future. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, much has been said already on my background. Uh, so, uh, our research is devoted to uh, metabolic engineering, cell engineering of uh, mainly of yeasts, uh, a few other microorganisms also um, uh, to be better platforms uh, in biotechnology and. Um, we devote a lot of work uh, to methylotrophic yeasts and, and to this yeast, which now is called Comagatella puffy. Uh, so yeah, it's a tongue breaker. I, I needed some time and my kind of uh, way to memorize the name is by the name after of the scientist after which uh, this was uh, given, uh, Dr. Komagata, who, uh, is a Japanese uh, yeast uh, taxonomist. Uh, so if you keep this in mind, Komagata, then Komagatella comes more fluently. Uh, yeah, so um, <clears throat> what was the motivation of our work? That's not a big surprise. Uh, uh, we are facing really uh, a climate crisis with increasing temperatures, uh, and this is very much due to greenhouse gas emissions and uh, carbon dioxide is one of the major emissions that are uh, today uh, really accepted and understood as being the main problem. Uh, and just yesterday, I read that again in the Arctic, uh, there are about 30 degrees uh, uh, centigrade, uh, which is amazing for us because we currently are about 15 uh, and usually rainy weather uh, the whole May. Uh, but uh, as you see here, uh, global temperature increase uh, over the last two decades. So that's very um, uh, really uh, clearly pointing to the problem. So uh, having uh, um, uh, microbial platforms or biotech platforms that can utilize carbon dioxide as carbon source uh, would be something really uh, useful and reasonable. So uh, to go back to uh, let's say the background and the development of the story, uh, as I said, uh, we are working with methylotrophic yeasts uh, since many years. Uh, and uh, in a nutshell, uh, they are named methylotrophic because they can utilize methanol and some other C1 compounds uh, as uh, their, their only carbon and energy source. And the most well-known of these species are uh, in the genus Comagatella, uh, formerly known as Pichia pastoris. And uh, the other well-known genus is Ogatea, uh, before it was uh, mainly called uh, Hansenola polymorpha, uh, and a few others. Uh, what uh, is a very specific phenotypic feature is uh, when these yeasts grow on methanol, they massively proliferate and grow their peroxisomes. You see that on this micrograph here or <clears throat> uh, on glucose, 
peroxisomes are essentially not visible. They are there, but uh, very small. While on methanol, peroxisomes are hugely expanded and uh, occupy a large part of uh, the cell interior. Um, <clears throat> and uh, they have this very structured uh, 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 inner uh, uh, structure, which uh, is uh, the enzymes that are semi-crystalline. We could say uh, densely pack the enzymes for methanol uh, metabolism. Uh, uh, just uh, to illustrate that on a level of uh, phylogeny, so if we look at this uh, phylogenetic tree of, uh, of budding yeasts, uh, we see Saccharomyces here and we see the genus Comagatella here. So <clears throat> in this range, that would be the methylotrophic yeasts. Uh, and essentially, if we look here, uh, we have a branch point here in two branches uh, where on one side, uh, uh, Saccharomyces and its relatives are found. And, and here is the branch where we also find the methylotrophic yeasts. So all the methylotrophic budding yeasts are rather closely related. Um, so specifically, if we look at uh, Comagatella, uh, uh, but the principle is, is true for all the methylotrophic yeasts uh, that, as I said, they assimilate methanol as their sole carbon source. Uh, and that means they need an efficient pathway to close carbon-carbon bonds. Essentially, every carbon-carbon bond in uh, the, their biomass uh, is made by their metabolism. And the pathway to make this carbon-carbon uh, bonds is uh, the so-called xylulose 5-phosphate cycle uh, because it involves xylulose 5-phosphate. And that is actually the substrate that accepts uh, uh, methanol or formaldehyde, we have to say, uh, uh, in a type of, uh, of transketolase uh, reaction uh, and then releases uh, two uh, C3 molecules uh, from which in the end uh, biomass is built up and the cellulose 5-phosphate needs to be recycled. And now that is uh, a very important point uh, because uh, for a long time, people thought that uh, this uh, cellulose 5-phosphate cycle is based on the pentose phosphate uh, pathway that uh, all uh, yeasts and, and essentially yeah, most organisms uh, feature. Um, but uh, we could show <clears throat> uh, that uh, all the uh, the enzymes for this cellulose 5-phosphate cycle are actually uh, an extra set of enzymes, of genes, uh, that are regulated by methanol and that uh, are uh, targeting their gene products uh, to the peroxisomes. So actually the entire cellulose 5-phosphate cycle is localized in the peroxisomes. And that's the setup of all the enzymes. Uh, what is here in orange uh, was uh, known before to be peroxisomal. And then we have this second copies uh, of uh, pentose phosphate pathway type enzymes. Uh, but these are the specific methanol pathway enzymes localized to peroxisomes. Uh, now, uh, with this knowledge and with the reactions, especially this cetoheptulose bisphosphate as an intermediate, uh, we could finally draw the map of the entire cellulose uh, five phosphate cycle, which is shown here. Uh, and uh, what was really intriguing uh, looking at that, that it closely resembles the well-known Calvin cycle as we know it from plants, for instance, for uh, CO2 assimilation. So if you look at the, uh, let's say the, the map of the reactions, you see that this uh, uh, nearly totally overlaps. And uh, also most of the reactions are based on the same enzymes and involving, of course, the same uh, intermediates. So uh, uh, 
uh, seeing that, uh, this of course triggered, let's say, the idea and the question whether we could use this uh, methanol assimilation pathway as a chassis, a blueprint uh, for a carbon dioxide assimilation pathway. And in the end, re-engineer the yeast so that it would use carbon dioxide instead of uh, methanol. And uh, uh, yeah, as said, uh, the basis of course is that both of these uh, C1 metabolism uh, of these pathways uh, share uh, similar reactions. And uh, the similarity is uh, even more uh, because as we have uh, found, uh, the methanol assimilation pathway is uh, compartmentalized, like the Calvin cycle is in plants. So uh, uh, we have no proof yet, but uh, it is of course tempting uh, to, to speculate that also for the yeast, for methanol assimilation, the compartmentalization is important to increase efficiency of the entire pathway. Like it is uh, in plants where uh, the Calvin cycle is uh, compartmentalized uh, to, um, <clears throat> to chloroplasts. So we have the, the organelles here, uh, chloroplasts here, peroxisomes, we have five shared biochemical reactions and essentially not a lot uh, really missing or being different. So yes, uh, the plan was to use the peroxisomes as uh, let's say the, the place to be uh, for this uh, synthetic Calvin cycle. And essentially um, uh, the entire concept of uh, modifying, of turning the methanol pathway into a CO2 pathway is illustrated here. So in a wild type, uh, Pichia pastoris or Comagatella, uh, methanol is taken up, it enters the peroxisomes, it is oxidized to formaldehyde, and then formaldehyde is used in two ways. Uh, one is the dissimilation to uh, gain energy, essentially the first uh, intermediate is energy age. So we have reducing equivalence and ATP can be made from that. And essentially formaldehyde is uh, oxidized in two steps to CO2. That's the energy module. And the other pathway is from formaldehyde into the xylulose monophosphate cycle, as I mentioned before. So in this cyclic pathway, uh, cellulose 5-phosphate is kind of uh, recycled uh, uh, and uh, for every three cycles, one molecule of glycyaldehyde 3-phosphate is, is generated and released uh, to form uh, biomass. So that's a wild type situation. And now the concept that we designed was what if we block the first reaction here from formaldehyde into the cycle. It is the enzyme uh, does uh, dehydroxyacetone synthase. There are two copies in the genome of Comagatella. And if we delete these copies of uh, dehydroxyacetone synthase, the idea was that uh, this entire assimilation part would be blocked and only energy formation would still be active. So uh, by this, uh, yeah, we could separate energy formation from methanol from uh, assimilation. And then by rebuilding uh, the Calvin cycle on the blueprint of the uh, cellulose monophosphate cycle, we should be able or the cells should be able to assimilate uh, CO2 into biomass, into growth. And the energy and reducing equivalence would come from methanol, but methanol in this concept should not enter uh, the uh, assimilation and, and essentially then the biomass. So by the separation of energy from the carbon metabolism, uh, we should be able to prove that we can assimilate CO2. <clears throat> okay. 
so this is uh, how it practically looks like. Uh, I will not go into details of every reaction, but that's another way of displaying the cellulose monophosphate cycle. So essentially we have here uh, methanol oxidation to formaldehyde and then the dehydroxyacetone synthase, which then enters methanol uh, into this uh, pathway in several cycles. And essentially it's always, it's these three cycles that we see here that recycle xylulose 5-phosphate. Okay, and on the right side, uh, we see the design of uh, the engineered Calvin cycle. And uh, what is in yellow here are the reactions that are still used uh, from the methanol assimilation pathway. In blue, we see reactions that all uh, yeasts uh, have in, in the cytosol, but we had to bring them into the peroxisomes and we took them from another yeast from uh, Ogatea, uh, simply not to, to um, get interference in the genome uh, with multiple copies. And then we have two uh, enzymes here indicated in green, which are the specific Calvin cycle enzymes, uh, phosphoribulose kinase and uh, Rubisco. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, that should enable all the reactions that are needed from CO2 on one side to recycle ribulose 5-phosphate, uh, which goes into the PRK reaction. And on the other hand, again, release uh, glycyaldehyde 3-phosphate uh, to enable growth of, of biomass. So that's the design, that is the blueprint. Um, and uh, this is the actual uh, plan uh, to realize it. And uh, all this uh, metabolic engineering has been realized by Thomas Gassler, who did his PhD with this project. So essentially you see here in blue again, the yeast enzymes from Ogatea, uh, which we brought in so that they were targeted to the peroxisomes. In green, you see the Calvin cycle specific genes, uh, Rubisco, we took from an autotrophic bacterium and the PRK is from spinach. And then uh, Rubisco is known to, to need, uh, uh, or specifically this bacterial Rubiscus need bacterial chaperones for their folding. So also these two chaperones. Uh, were brought in um, and essentially uh, with uh, integrating uh, these eight genes uh, uh, at the same time we knocked out uh, the two uh, DAS genes and we also knocked out uh, one of the alcohol oxidase genes. So uh, using them as kind of landing pads in uh, genome engineering when we brought in the heterologous genes. Okay, so that's the setup. And then of course, uh, it was super exciting whether uh, uh, the, the whole design would work and whether we would see any growth on carbon dioxide. And excitingly, yes, uh, even in the very first setup. Um, and uh, we then also tested, of course, if uh, the the idea of targeting to peroxisomes into a compartment uh, was really necessary and, and the right one. So uh, we also created a cytosolic variant of the CPP, the Calvin cycle. So uh, here we have in black the peroxisomal version as illustrated before uh, in magenta, a cytosolic version and in blue, an interrupted version as a negative control. And this is growth experiments as we usually do them on um, in shake flask uh, with methanol as energy source and with uh, elevated CO2 levels uh, in the ambient air. So the negative control does not grow and that is uh, what we are expecting and hoping for, of course. Um, and uh, the cytosolic version actually showed some growth, but significantly slower growth than the peroxisomal version. So 
uh, this indicates that really the peroxisomal version has a clear benefit uh, for the efficiency of uh, CO2 assimilation. So that uh, was a very good starting point. And what followed is uh, verification whether we can have uh, uh, elongated uh, longer growth uh, in bioreactors. And uh, we have that here. So that's over several four or five generations. Uh, and we have consistent growth of uh, uh, several parallel cultures here. And if we re-inoculate from a sample taken here, uh, we see the same growth pattern over and over. So essentially we have infinite uh, growth on CO2 as carbon source. Uh, and that uh, of course is, uh, is already a very uh, clear proof and evidence that we, we have created a stable autotrophic yeast that can grow on CO2. Um, yeah, we then did uh, carbon 13 labeling uh, to prove that really carbon from CO2 is incorporated into the biomass and that essentially CO2 is the only carbon source for the newly grown biomass. Uh, now it's a bit tricky to label with uh, uh, CO2 with carbon-13 CO2 in the gas phase. You would need a lot of carbon-13 um, and uh, technically it's a bit tricky. So we have adapted a strategy which we call inverse carbon-13 labeling um, in the way that in a first step we labeled the biomass fully with carbon-13, with uh, C13 glycerol, so that uh, the biomass would be 100% or nearly 100% C13 labeled. And then we switch to CO2 growth conditions where essentially uh, the only C12 that goes in is CO2. Uh, so we have methanol, which should not be assimilated, and this is also carbon-13. Uh, and we have CO2, which is carbon-12. And <clears throat> if the cells then grow, uh, they would lose uh, carbon-13 in their biomass. Uh, we also looked at the, uh, the metabolome around this Calvin cycle. And uh, in the first step, we see that uh, the C13 content after this labeling phase is nearly 100%. And as well, the metabolites are nearly 100% labeled. It's never fully 100% because there is some C12 in, in, in the C13 samples. Okay, so that's the starting point. And then after uh, the growth phase on C12, which is kind of the labeling with the C12 uh, CO2, uh, we see that the cultures, this is the important ex, uh, experiment here, with the intact Calvin cycle uh, growing on C12 CO2 and C13 methanol loses after one generation loses about 50% of the C13 content. Or in other words, it gains C12 from CO2 and uh, that matches, of course, with the growth. Uh, so if the biomass doubles, uh, the C13 content should go to 50%. Perfectly fine. Uh, surprisingly, at the metabolite level, the labeling pattern was even much stronger. In other words, uh, nearly 90% of the initial C13 was exchanged by C12. So CO2 uh, was really very efficiently incorporated into the metabolome uh, of this strain. Good, so um, that all, uh, of course, uh, uh, fitted very nicely. Uh, what was still uh, kind of a, uh, yeah, a, a point for improvement is uh, the growth rate. So actually the initial growth rate of the strains that we generated was uh, below 0 0.01 per hour. 
um, are really quite slow. So we went for adaptive laboratory evolution, uh, which is uh, quite time consuming with such uh, slow growth rates. And uh, just in a nutshell, the principle, uh, if any of you is not, not so familiar with it, uh, uh, essentially for adaptive laboratory evolution, you uh, most people dilute their uh, cultures over many generations uh, uh, with uh, the idea that uh, beneficial mutations that would increase the growth rate uh, would then take over because uh, essentially, yeah, their uh, progeny will grow faster. And uh, over time, if you do it right, you can uh, uh, manifest uh, those mutations that lead to faster growth rate in such a process. So you have uh, serial dilutions, like uh, in our case, every two or three days, uh, you would uh, inoculate a new culture, uh, grow it for a few days, and then re-inoculate, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, so over time, with number of generations, you get a fitness increase. This is what we see here. Most people, and we also relied on uh, on the natural mutation rate. Okay, and because it goes slowly, so after about 30 generations, uh, we had uh, a, uh, a culture and we isolated individual clones uh, that were growing faster and the fastest is this one. So if this was the bioreactor cultures uh, of the initial strain, uh, then uh, this one, this is the growth curve of the evolved strain. Uh, and essentially, yeah, we see a, a doubling of uh, the specific growth rate in the evolved strain. So this is already getting into a range uh, where let's say a slow uh, methanol based uh, industrial processes are run with uh, Comagatella. Yeah, it's of course then interesting to understand what the mutations are. Uh, so we went to resequencing uh, the best uh, mutants, the fastest growing mutants and as well the parents. And to cut the story short, we saw two mutations uh, or two genes that carried several mutations. Uh, and one is PRK. So the phosphoribulose kinase, the, the heterologous, uh, and uh, I have to say not to a, a full surprise, uh, what we saw is that the mutations reduce the activity of PRK. So that's illustrated here. And these data are from the PhD thesis of Michael Baumschabel, who is following up on this, uh, uh, say the, uh, the optimization of, of the Calvin cycle. Uh, he could show that the uh, PRK activity in the mutant is about half of the PRK activity uh, in the parent. And our hypothesis is uh, that there is an imbalance in the Calvin cycle, or in other words, the probably the Rubisco reaction is not uh, strong enough uh, uh, to cope with the activity of PRK as it was. And this obviously led to some imbalance that was then impairing growth. And with a better balancing of the two reactions, uh, it seems that the cells can cope better and grow faster. So that opens, of course, a lot of room for uh, uh, further work and 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 uh, further engineering and improving of the entire cycle, but this is where we are. So understanding where one of the bottlenecks uh, of uh, this uh, re-engineered Calvin cycle is. Okay, uh, yeah, uh, we. It, it took us, I have to say, more than a year of reviewing and uh, revising, uh, reworking parts, uh, additional experiments. Uh, um, but we finally got 
the work published in Nature Biotechnology, which uh, of course uh, uh, was uh, excellent uh, to see for us. And, and it was really at that time, uh, the first example of a recombinant uh, autotrophic organism that, uh, or the turning modification of a heterotroph into an autotroph. Uh, like often in science at the same time, uh, uh, the, a similar work on E. coli uh, came out. Uh, and so at the same time, both the, this yeast work and, and the E. coli work uh, could be published. Uh, we got actually quite a lot of uh, press coverage and interestingly also in Spain and in, in Latin America because the Spanish um, news agency uh, jumped on it. So uh, we got quite some feedback then uh, from this work and uh, uh, that uh, of course uh, was exciting and, and some fun also and uh, most fun we had with uh, some of the the reader comments in the chats to uh, these articles and uh, so we had one reader uh, who wrote still I don't want to live in a world uh, where so much yeast is lying around like we have forests now okay I guess that probably is not gonna happen uh, Another one said, now it's going to be difficult for the greens, genetic engineering or climate change. Um, yeah, I'm not commenting on that, but uh, yeah, actually we see some kind of rethinking of, uh, of GMO considerations in, in some countries. Uh, uh, and the last one, that's my favorite, uh, he wrote, uh, cool, boozing beer to save the planet. Okay, whatever we make out of this. Okay, then uh, with uh, just a few words, uh, I want to highlight a bit of uh, still unpublished work uh, um, towards the idea of uh, not just growing yeast biomass, but to make chemicals from CO2. Uh, with metabolically engineered yeast based on, on this autotrophic strain. And we chose two model products for this work. Uh, that is lactic acid and itaconic acid. Uh, essentially, uh, the motivation is that both are, uh, are industrially important. They are precursors for different kinds of polymers uh, like PLA or uh, uh, itaconic acid can substitute acrylic and metacrylic acid for different types of polymers. And the second motivation is that the pathway engineering is quite easy. Essentially, it is uh, one enzyme in both cases. Here, lactate dehydrogenase to make lactate. And uh, this uh, cis-aconitate uh, decarboxylase makes itaconate or itaconic acid from cisaconitate. So both use uh, uh, native uh, substrates of carbon metabolism and in one step turns them to the desired product. Um, so yeah, and what, what should be highlighted also uh, for uh, itaconate what is important here is this transporter, the mitochondrial transporter to get cisaconitate out of mitochondria uh, to uh, be there uh, in the place where itaconate should be made. Yeah, this is an ongoing project and the two people who mainly work on it are again, Michael uh, Baumschabel with his PhD and Özge Atter uh, is a uh, a researcher, a postdoc researcher in the lab and is supervising and this project and uh, mainly working on the itaconate story. Okay, and just a few words on itaconate production to give you a taste of where this is going. So by overexpressing the CAD enzyme uh, from Aspergillus tereus, uh, what we can show, we still have growth with this strain and the strain makes uh, about 
250 milligrams per liter itaconic acid. Uh, so for a very first uh, engineering, this is not a bad starting point. Uh, and then uh, what uh, Ötzke and uh, uh, Lisa, uh, who works with her, did was uh, to overexpress, overexpress also the transporter gene, MTTA. Uh, and it turned out that this is a bit tricky uh, because strong, too strong overexpression of MTTA uh, makes things really bad. The cells stop growing and they hardly produce. Uh, so they played with the promoter strengths for MTTA overexpression. And in the best case, the best combination, they could reach about 700 milligrams per liter. So again, the balancing of the reactions turns out to be very important. And uh, finally, by increasing this initial starting uh, cell density and also increasing the CO2 concentration, uh, so playing with the culture conditions, finally now we are reaching nearly two grams per liter, uh, making itaconic acid from carbon dioxide. So that's where we are currently. Um, and uh, uh, as a conclusion, uh, first step, we turned Pichia pastoris or Comagatella into a chemo-organo autotrophic organism to grow on carbon dioxide uh, with this a heterologous Calvin cycle. And uh, yeah, next steps are to produce uh, biomass really efficiently and also chemicals based on CO2. And one point that we are exploring also is alternative energy sources. So in other words, alternatives uh, to uh, methanol. And, and I want to thank you for your attention. Thank you, Vidhar. It was a really nice talk and uh, it's amazing the things that you achieved in the last years. So yeah, to the participants, uh, now we have a uh, time for questions. If you have any questions, you can write uh, in the chat and I'll ask, or if you want to ask me for open the mic for the, the, the any participant. And uh, in the meantime, I have a, myself a few questions because uh, I was uh, curious to know if did you uh, make a like a evolutionary comparative analysis between the um, Comagataela uh, yeast and the Calvin the plant cycle and the yeast cycle to see if the origins of the genes are somehow similar or common or are completely different. And it's a conver convergent uh, evolution somehow. Yeah, yeah, it's very clear that it is a, a, a kind of a con converging uh, evolution mm -hmm. behind because uh, these duplicated genes in the yeast they are extremely similar uh, to their cytosolic counterpart. And also they are each localized very close or next ad adjacent to their cytosolic counterpart. So it is obviously uh, a, a gene duplication that happened in yeast evolution. So um, nothing to do and, with the Calvin cycle in plants. Uh, no, no, it's just, it's obviously using the same kind of blueprint of reactions. And that is, I mean, we can only speculate. Uh, probably it is just so because it is efficient. Okay. Uh, so, it's, yeah, it's not the perfect answer, I'm aware. Oh, yeah. uh, what is interesting to say is uh, that... Uh, um, uh, the yeast bases, wherever reduction equivalents are needed, bases this on NADH, while the plants bases it on NADPH. Okay. Uh, which, yeah, which is a, a metabolic difference. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And, uh, it's different. Yeah, but that's probably mainly because, yeah, 
uh, what the the energy source is and which enzymes and cofactors are used there yeah <clears throat> so in the in that regard i also had a, uh have you speculated uh, in any way I, I think it's quite difficult but any way to eliminate the methanol from the equation because the plants they have light but uh, mm -hmm. do you have any other possibility to to avoid this part of the, the um, pathway uh, yes uh, that's that's a very good point uh, and there are several reasons why methanol is not uh, not ideal mm -hmm. uh, so the first one is uh, uh, that uh, uh, methanol dissimulation is energetically not optimal in yeast uh, that is mainly because the first step the alcohol oxidase is kind of energetically wasteful uh, that's good for the for the kinetics of the reaction but uh, uh, their oxygen is the electron acceptor and then the energy is lost, so to say, for the cell. Uh, the other uh, reason is that if we think of, of uh, let's say, a green supply of such a chemical energy source, methanol is way more difficult than formate, for instance. So okay. to make formate from CO2 is, is easier than, than methanol and cheaper. So in other words, formate would be a quite logical uh, alternative. There is good reasons uh, to use uh, a chemical energy source instead of light. So one of the limitations of, of uh, algae cultures uh, in bioreactors is light, actually, to bring light into, into the reactor. Mm -hmm. So that's why we often see these tubular reactors and complicated setups or plate reactors uh, because the uh, the penetration of light in, into the liquid is is uh, limit, uh, very limited. To have a liquid uh, chemical energy source has a lot of advantages. Uh, it can be stored easily, it can be transported, it can be easily mixed into the bioreactor in large scale. Um, so that's really what we are aiming at. Uh, and we have actually, we are starting now a, uh, a, a Horizon 2020 project with groups that work on, on CO2 concentration and CO2 reduction and exactly addressing these problems uh, on what would be the best uh, energy sources and can we use them and implement them in our processes. But right. yeah, that's a very good point. There are some uh, autotrophic bacteria that use um, uh, hydrogen as energy source. And again, hydrogen, I mean, hydrogen is quite well available, but it is difficult to handle for many reasons. Uh, it's, it's explosive, it's gaseous, uh, difficult to to uh, yeah dissolve in water, etc. So. Uh, we think we are on, on a good side with, let's say, a liquid energy source. Yeah. Because when you do the experiments, what, what you put uh, CO2 on the, on the atmosphere of the culture? Yeah, when we do shake flask, uh, we, we have an incubator where we can, can feed CO2 to the air. So we have usually 5 or 10% CO2 in, in the air and in the bioreactor, we also feed CO2 into the inlet air. Okay. So the, this air that is parched in is enriched in CO2. Yeah. So yeah, uh, finally, I have one question that uh, after you talk, uh, I, can, I can see a biomass produ production to incorporate the CO2, but do you have any idea what we can do with this biomass to be uh, I mean, from a point of view of uh, sustainability? Yeah, yeah. Well, one, uh, let's say, 
tier future application could be animal feed. Uh, so yeah. a, a protein um, supplement to animal feed uh, to avoid, for instance, uh, soy protein feeding. Yeah. Uh, soy protein creates a lot of environmental problems. And generally speaking, uh, we are using we, that means the world, uh, about half of the arable land for animal feeding. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, seeing the, the still growing population and, and uh, rise in, in meat consumption, um, this will create really a lot of problems. And, and if we can avoid uh, using land to produce animal feed and instead have a, a sustainable, let's say, bioreactor based uh, production of animal feed uh, that could solve a lot of problems that are around now. We can also think of human protein nutrition, of course. Uh, so uh, these directions are open and the benefit would be instead of using like glucose as a substrate for, for biotechnology that we really don't need uh, um, agriculture for that. Oh, I see. So my final question is, so uh, what do you think uh, or where do you have to work in to create a real uh, uh, alternative to decrease the CO2 in the earth, like a big plant of uh, big reactors growing uh, this yeast, but what do you have to work in? The efficiency, the growth rate, the coupling of the reactions? What do you think is mm -hmm. the limiting part where we can uh, to, to make a, a real... Approach? Yeah, yeah. So uh, one part certainly is, is uh, still the growth rate. Yes. Um, another is uh, the energy source. So uh, I mentioned this in partial inefficiency of methanol use. Uh, this is a problem that uh, uh, needs to be solved. So there is no doubt about that. Uh, and um, or using alternative energy sources. These are the main questions I would address for biomass. And then of course, thinking of instead of biomass, thinking of uh, large scale chemical productions, we need to address, of course, large scale products. Uh, and therefore we went for these uh, bulk chemicals, the precursors for, for polymers, for plastics, because polymers are the single largest, uh, let's say chemical product class by mm -hmm. far that, that we are producing. So that could really make a, a, a significant uh, impact and significant in, in the sense of that it is measurable. Yeah, I see. So in other words, about 10% of the fossil resources that are used are for, for plastics. And let's say dreaming of, uh, uh, yeah, converting that to, to a bio-based production, we could take off 10% uh, of of CO2 emissions, essentially, or the release, let's say, of what is now stored as fossil resources. Mm. Amazing. Yeah, thank you. Beautiful. Yeah, but still, of course, a long way to go. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's a one possibility mm. to, to, to create this, this alternative to decrease the CO2. So yeah, I had uh, so finally I have to to say thanks and thanks for the participants to be here uh, because you know I know you are a very busy person so I really think you have saved the time to be with us um, in this pandemic uh, era via web <laughs> but uh, yeah I only have. Uh, Simple words for you and thank you very much to be with us. Uh, and I hope we can meet in real pers in person some some somehow uh, next year. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much and and thanks to everyone 
who participated. Uh, I hope it was of some interest. Uh, what I forgot to mention is uh, for any of you who is interested in yeast, uh, uh, please note the International Congress on Yeasts uh, that will be online, like all conferences, uh, this year in August. Uh, I think, Roberto, if I send you uh, some yeah. information, you can spread it. And, and of course, okay. yeah, people will know. Uh, also in, in your institute. So I I hope to see many of you uh, yeah. there also. Sure. We'll be there online. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, thank you, Diehat. It was really, really nice. Pleasure to have you here. Thank you and see you there. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.